USB, the universal way to connect devices together. Until recently, anyway. The move to USB Type-C has meant that some devices now just use USB Type-C, like this laptop. It's exclusively USB Type-C, and there's no way to plug in USB Type-A devices unless a dongle is used. And this has meant that we're in a sort of awkward transitional phase where some devices use USB Type-C, other devices don't, and some you just don't want to upgrade. And um, that's not a solution. So in this video, I'm going to be showing you how to convert the older USB Type-A devices into being Type-C. It's not particularly difficult, but you do need to be quite precise. So let's get to it. USB has been around for well over 20 years and has had quite a few updates through its lifetime. The first version of USB introduced the connector that we're all familiar with, and inside featured a pair of wires for power and another pair for data. It's considered a host port, so the other end of a cable is either terminated at the device that's being plugged in or at a sub-connector known as a USB Type-B port, which you may have seen on a printer or a scanner. When USB 2.0 came along soon afterwards, it kept the same internal wiring configuration, but increased transfer speeds by 40 times and introduced a couple of sub-connectors for connecting smaller devices. USB 3.0, on the other hand, brought the first wiring change to the standard as it introduced two more data transfer wire pairs. This vastly increased transfer speeds again, and to maintain backwards compatibility, they tacked on additional sections to the subconnectors so that devices could still use older USB cables, though at the cost of speed. So, as you can see, it's evolved a lot over the years, and has become a bit of a complicated mess of different connector types. So, in an effort to consolidate things, the standard has introduced a new host connector known as USB Type-C. It offers some nice advantages in that it's much smaller and can be plugged in either way around, as well as having some serious power delivery options. What's most interesting about it is that it can actually replace all of the sub-connectors too, and eventually most devices will have this new connector, regardless of whether it's a host or a sub-device, and for either charging or being charged. That's super practical, and I'm looking forward to it. But at the moment, as I said, you will probably have a lot of devices that use any of the previous generations. So we're going to jumpstart these older devices into the new era of USB Type-C. So the first device I'm going to show you how to convert is in fact a mouse. Now this is a fairly high-end mouse that was bought a few years ago, and it still works fine to this day, except for the receiver is USB Type-A, which means I can't use it on my laptop without the stupid dongle. Now the manufacturer, for some reason, doesn't make a USB Type-C version of this receiver yet anyway, um, so we're going to convert it. Now to do this, the first thing to do is get to the PCB that's on the inside which for a device as small as this needs to be done by opening up the USB plug itself. Now that we're in, you can see that the PCB is very small and has four copper tracers on it. These copper tracers fit into a USB type A port to make electrical contact. So from this diagram, we can work out which ones do what. These outer two are for power and the inner two are for data. We now need a USB-C breakout board. This is basically just a USB-C connector that's been soldered onto a small PCB, allowing us to jack into its internal pins. It's absolutely tiny and inexpensive, and you can find links to them in this video's description. As you can see, its own solder pads are labelled as B10, B11, A7, A6, A3 and A2. These labels correspond to various pins on the Type-C connector, and I'll be breaking this down throughout the video so that by the end of it, you should understand what is what. The first ones we'll look at are A7 and A6. These are for USB 2.0 connectivity, so are the first pads that we need to connect for basic devices like my mouse. For this step, we'll need a soldering iron and some solder. Most of us will either have one of these already, or know somebody who does. If not, they're quite inexpensive from your local hardware store. So the first thing to do is add a dab of solder onto A7 and A6, after which they're ready for us to attach some wires. 
A good source for this is actually an old USB cable, as most of us have plenty of these lying around. We can just use some wire cutters to open it up and pull out the little wires on the inside. As a general rule in the USB world, green and white are the data wires for USB 2.0 devices. So we can expose the ends of these, again with the wire cutters, and dab on some more solder. As A6 corresponds to data positive, it can have a green wire attached, while A7 needs a white wire as it's data negative. Going back to the mouse receiver, we saw by observation earlier that this one is data negative, requiring the white wire, while the other one is data positive, requiring the green wire. Now on the other side of the breakout board there are two more solder pads, one being labelled as G for ground and the other V for voltage. These are the power negative and positive pads, so we can solder a red and black wire to these, and again by observation work out which pads on the receiver they should connect to. With that done, it is in theory ready to test out, but first double check your connections so that you're sure it's done correctly, and as with everything, proceed at your own risk. Now in all likelihood, when you do this, you will be disappointed, because nothing will happen and the device won't be detected. This is because USB-C requires the plugged in device to tell it whether it is a host or a sub-device. And for some reason, the vast majority of USB-C breakout boards currently available appear to be configured to be host devices rather than sub-devices. This is all down to the resistance applied to a USB-C connector's internal pins A5 and B5. If their voltage is pulled up from the power lane through a resistor each, it will act as a host device. If their voltage is pulled down through a resistor to ground, it acts as a sub-device. Looking very closely at the board, we can actually see this resistor, and indeed it is pulling up power from the voltage pad. If we scrape away the trace for this to disconnect it, we can replace its function with a 5.1 kiloohm resistor going to ground instead. Now I actually used a 4.7 kiloohm resistor here, but despite this, it thankfully worked just fine when plugged in. The mouse works perfectly and is now natively USB Type-C. Now having all the wires exposed with a PCB hanging off looks awful however, and would break very very quickly. So to rectify this, I recommend moulding a small case for it out of Sugru. This is available in plenty of different colours so you can customise things to your liking, and I've gone with apple green. As you bundle things together, make sure that you don't short any connections out by pushing it against the USB-C plug's outer shell and make sure you gently mush the Sugru in between the wires. This will keep them safe and make it nice and robust once it's set into a hard rubber. Admittedly, it does look a little bit homemade, but the thing is, this is the first USB Type-C receiver ever for this mouse, and it does work really well, so I'm super happy with it. Now this does still stick out a little bit, so I wouldn't want to leave it connected during transport for example, but it is so much better than the adapter that came with the laptop. And uh, even if you have a smaller adapter that hasn't got a wire attached like this one, um, in comparison it's still significantly smaller. So I would say that's quite a success and uh, not bad at all. Now this little hack, or mod if you will, is not just limited to converting things for laptops, like USB receivers, um, but you can actually use it for a variety of different devices too. For example, I've got this Fleur One thermal camera, and it's actually intended to be plugged into smartphones. However, it was made a few years ago and still uses the older Micro B connector, so unfortunately I can't plug it into my newer phone unless I use another silly dongle. So in an effort to get at the USB connector, I can simply prise off the back and unscrew the board to lift it out, putting it safely to one side for now. Interestingly, the USB connector board is completely separate, which does make my job a bit easier. The first task here though is to work out which pins represent power and ground. To do this, I've plugged it into my old phone to measure a few pins with a multimeter to find out which ones display as being 5 volts. With them noted down, I can now remove the internal connector pins and solder a new red and black wire to it, matching the previous connector board's configuration. 
Now, there's no easy way to measure which pins are for data positive and data negative, so I just took a guess and soldered them up in the same order that they would be on a USB connector. I can always swap this around later as they're unlikely to cause damage, though again, this is at your own risk. The other end of this can now be soldered to another breakout board, and instead of using a full one, I'm actually going to use a trimmed down version. This one only provides the data pads for data positive and data negative, excluding all USB 3.0 related pads, which we will be exploring later by the way. Uh, but this is all that many devices need, so I thought I'd include it here as an example as it is a little easier to solder to thanks to the larger spacing in between the pads. Again though, my board here needs the resistor to be changed to one going to the ground pad to make sure that it's configured into sub-device mode. The layout is a little different here though, so I'm going to have to wipe the resistor off entirely with the soldering iron rather than just scraping off its connecting trace. Once all the wires are soldered up according to their colours, it's ready to put back together. Before I do this though, it's necessary to increase the size of the connector's hole so that it can fit through it. After which, the whole thing can be carefully reassembled. And, sure enough, it now works with my new phone without a problem. So that's given a new lease of life to an old device, and it's even added a new feature because USB Type-C is of course reversible, which means that it can be plugged in the other way around so you can do thermal selfies, which is kind of cool. Now before I move on and show you the last device to convert, which is a USB 3.0 device, it's time for a quick ad from Blinkist. These days, with so many distractions around us, it's often quite difficult to just sit down and learn something new, and because of this, we often miss out on the deeper knowledge that's found in well-researched books. Now, if this sounds familiar, then I recommend that you check out Blinkist, as they take key insights from over 3,000 non-fiction bestsellers and condense them down into 15-minute blinks, which help you to understand the core ideas at hand. Now these can be either read through at your own leisure, or even better, listened to, which is great for when you're perhaps commuting to work, or working out. Now, the first 100 of you to visit Blinkist.com slash DIY Perks are going to get access to a free 7-day unlimited access trial, which you can cancel at any point, so no pressure. But if you do decide to go with them, you get 25% off, which is great value. So again, that's Blinkist.com slash DIY Perks. Now the devices I've shown you how to convert so far, like the mouse and the thermal camera, they're all devices that are warrant really converting, because this is an expensive mouse, or it was when it was first bought. It's still good, I like using it, so I don't really want to get rid of it and buy a new one. And same with the thermal camera. It works fine, it just needed a different connector. However, this third device, which I'm going to be showing you, doesn't really make too much sense because it's a USB 3.0 hub and card reader, and these aren't that expensive to buy as a USB-C version. Um, and if you didn't want to buy a new one, you could always just use an adapter. Because being on a wire anyway, it's not too obtrusive. However, it is USB 3.0, so I'm going to be using it just as an example to show you how to convert a USB 3.0 device. Now the first thing to do is actually chop the end off. Now this might seem a little bit extreme, but it's the only way to access the wires, of which, as you can see, there are twice as many. This is because it has two more data transfer wire pairs, like I mentioned earlier, which are yellow and blue, and purple and orange. Everything else about this conversion is the same as the previous two, so after changing the resistor and soldering in place the power and data positive and data negative cables, it can technically work as is, although only at the slower USB 2.0 speeds. To get this thing running at full speed, we need to solder the extra wire pairs in place. As this is acting as a sub-device, blue-yellow function as super speed transmit, and purple-orange function as super speed receive. Basically, this means that purple goes to B10, orange to B11, blue to A3, and yellow to A2. Any open ground wires can be twisted together and connected to the ground pad. Now, to protect all of this, an alternative to Sugru is to actually use two-part epoxy. This makes for a very strong casing for it, with a smooth finish. Again, this works brilliantly, and the USB 3.0 functionality allows for blazingly fast transfer speeds. 
A side note is that this will work off a USB-C phone as well, allowing you to plug in extra peripherals and storage. This really shows off how awesome USB Type-C is and how it is definitely the future. So I hope you have success making your own USB-C devices. Now I actually really like the USB Type-C connection, it's way better than USB Type-A and uh, I'm looking forward to a time when everything is USB Type-C so this isn't necessary. But until then, hopefully this video will bridge the gap. Now a big thanks to my patrons who are supporting my work at patreon.com slash DIY perks. You guys are awesome so thanks a lot. And uh, in terms of the next project I might do, um, at time of recording we are in lockdown and a lot of people are working from home and uh, apparently webcams are in short supply. So I was wondering whether you guys want me to show you how to turn an old laptop into a webcam as in taking out the module, not using the laptop. So you literally make the webcam yourself. Now it is something that I have covered in other videos, um, but I, I do wonder whether you guys would like me to revisit the topic and make specifically a webcam. So uh, let me know in the comments below. But other than that, I'm Matt, you've been watching DIY Perks, and I hope to see you next time. Goodbye for now.